Good morning to some of you and good afternoon to others. My name is Steve London and I'm recently retired as a partner from Troutman Pepper in Boston. I'm a national co-chair of Jewish National Fund USA Lawyers for Israel. On behalf of Jewish National Fund Lawyers for Israel, I want to express our appreciation to each of you in our community for your continued support and commitment to the land and people of Israel. I'm proud to share with you today that our lawyers division is now over 1,000 members strong and has raised nearly $10 million since October. This November 30th through December 3rd, please join us for the Jewish National Fund USA Global Conference for Israel in Denver, Colorado. I was happy to participate in the Boston Conference last year. And in Denver together, we'll gather to celebrate our successes and achievements and honor you as our partners. Details may be found at jnf.org backslash NC. As a member of Lawyers for Israel, Jewish National Fund's National Online Attorney Referral Directory enables you to connect with like-minded Israel supporters throughout the country. This will enable you to upload your professional information as a referral source. I know from personal experience, this has enabled me to connect with attorneys throughout the country to refer work to their firms. You'll receive the link via email following the program. Being added to the directory is one of the perks of joining our Lawyers for Israel Society. Hello, hi, my name is Ellen Lawson and I'm a solo attorney in Scottsdale as well as a Desert States board member and proud member of Lawyers for Israel. Thank you again to all of our attendees for taking time today to join us on this very informative program. As members of Lawyers for Israel, we have so much to be proud of and even more to accomplish. If you are not yet a member of Jewish National Fund Lawyers for Israel, please consider an annual donation of $1,800 or more to join our growing group of Israel supporting lawyers. I'd like to now turn the program over to Maya Aaron, partner at Mark Migdal and Hayden in Miami. Thank you, Ellen. Today's presentation will be based on three blocks. Block one, a review of the White House national strategy to counter anti-Semitism. Block two, International Court of Justice, an update. And block three, Israel and the UN. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A section that can be found at the bottom of your screen. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. Arsene Ostrovsky is an attorney and CEO of the International Legal Forum, an Israel-based global network of over 4,000 lawyers and activists, standing up for Israel and leading the fight against anti-Semitism, terror, and BDS in the international legal arena. Arsen has spoken before the UN, the European Parliament and Congress. In 2018, he was awarded the Nefesh Benefesh Bonetium Prize in Israel Advocacy. And last year, he was recognized by Dalgenmeyer as one of the top 100 people positively influencing Jewish life. Arsen is also a columnist for Newsweek magazine, where he writes about Israel, anti-Semitism and international affairs. Without further ado, please welcome Arsen Ostrovsky. Hi there, everyone. Thank you for that uh, for that wonderful in introduction. It uh, it really is a it's an honor for me to to speak and to address uh, JNF USA today. And I, I have a lot of a lot of respect, a lot of appreciation um, for the work that you do. You know, for me, who someone of who's you know my Zionism really guides everything I do. You know, I, I know that there are some out there in the broader community that 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 talk about Zionism, that talk about Israel, uh, but then there are others that actually do. Others that actually are guided by not just words but actions, and uh, JNF USA is certainly 
uh, certainly that, and you're in fact, I think, leading in that regard in so many ways in the Jewish community and the work that you're doing both here in Israel and of course with, uh, within the United States um, as well. So from my perspective, that's certainly incredibly uh, and deeply appreciated as an Israeli, uh, but also as a lawyer, specifically the work that uh, that all of you here on this uh, on this group um, that are joining us on this webinar do as well. Um, you know, I, I look at the this sort of situation from, well, you know, on, on the one hand, you know, I'm under no illusion that we are under, facing so many challenges in the legal arena, uh, BDS, uh, anti-Zionism at the UN, um, in the international courts, you name it. But on the other hand, the law is one of those few rare uh, vehicles that gives us that opportunity to actually take that frustration and to actually turn something from passive action to proactive action and to use our, our legal skills in uh, essentially standing up for Israel, standing up for the Jewish people and combating anti-Semitism. So I think uh, all of you here have an incredible uh, part to play in that. I know you do that every day. And um, so again, uh, very grateful from my perspective and I hope we can uh, we can work together and collaborate uh, together as we, uh, as we move forward. Um, as per the the introduction, we, we, have, we have a lot to cover, uh, so I'm going to be try. I'm going to try and be as brief as I can. Um, there's three topic areas we wanted to have a look at: anti-Semitism, specifically with the White House uh, strategy, um, what's happening with the Court of Justice, which is very relevant, and some of the developments uh, to be looking for at the UN. I'll try and speak for about ten or twelve minutes on each section and allow enough time for Q and A, which. You know, quite frankly, I'm, I much prefer to have more questions and opportunity to engage uh, with you. Uh, so please uh, feel free to, um, I believe there's a question, uh, there's a chat option at the bottom or Q&A, which I think you've been uh, informed about. So feel free to, to ask questions. And as I think um, was said, I'll stay around for a little bit at the end as well. Um, so to, to begin, uh, the, the, the first sort of topic, and I know that's been on a lot of people's minds and it's been in the news a lot, is just the recent uh, White House um, White House National Strategy on Combating Antisemitism. This is something that has been in the works for many, many months, um, and it was finally handed down in the last, um, um, about a week or so ago. Um, there's no... Um, there's a lot there that we can talk about. Um, there's been a lot of uh, big focus specifically on um, on how anti-Semitism would be defined within that plan. Uh, but there are a lot of other things that uh, we can also look at and think it's important when analyzing it. Um, but at, at, at the end of the day, there is no silver bullet in combating anti-Semitism. This is the longest, uh, most virulent, most pernicious hatred. And as the the late Lord Rabbi Sachs said, it's like a mutating virus, which through the generations has mutated, but the one constant has always been uh, the denial and rejection of, uh, of Jews uh, to live as free and equal uh, human beings. Um, now, there's a lot of, uh, when looking at the, the strategy, there'll be people who will think that it is the best strategy they've ever seen. There'll be others who, who, who will be saying that, you know, this is uh, like Swiss cheese full of holes and, and problem areas. Uh, personally, I take a middle of the ground approach. Um, I know that's rather loyally, so my apologies for that. Uh, but at the end of the day, and I'll, I'll explain why, look, it's not perfect. Um, there are a number of flaws within the plan. Um, they're not insignificant flaws. They do exist there, and we do need to look at them in more detail. But, and it's important also, there are many, many positives to this plan as well that we need to draw from, including the... Uh, reiterating the embrace for the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism and the fact that at the end of the day, this is one of the most comprehensive and detailed um, plans to counter anti-Semitism and Jew hatred in all its various um, manifestations. Um, so I'll try and break it down essentially in three in three parts into the good, the bad, and essentially what I look at uh, as the in-between. In uh, first, the good. Um, the, the report is about 60 plus pages. Um, it is the most detailed, the most comprehensive plan we have seen to date. Um, it contains over 100 plus action items from across the across the spectrum in a multifaceted manner. It include uh, it gives uh, national um, attention and cross agency um, priority to the combating of anti-Semitism across the different. 
um, different organs of the of the administration and then the government level. Um, there is support for security initiatives, for community building, for interfaith programs, for education, specifically Holocaust education, which is uh, which is singled out. But not only, they also talk about education uh, to unions, education uh, to small businesses, which is something that often is, you know, as well forgotten. Um, it talks about also promotion of and access to kosher food. Um, likewise, something that's relevant. Um, it requires a national assessment by the FBI and the, the Counterterrorism uh, Center of um, reporting of anti-Semitic incidents. Um, it talks about creation of uh, training and development programs for um, in diversity training for federal workers as well. Um, and it does importantly single out anti-Semitism on campus as well, which is critical because it uh, really a uh, uh, in terms of today, where we see this explosion of Jew hatred uh, on campuses and across universities. And ultimately, yes, it does also embrace the IHRA definition, which I'll touch on a little bit after in, in a moment. But I did want to also talk about some of the not so good aspects of the plan, which th there are, and it's important that we also cover them. Um, the, um, uh, the, the plan could have been clearer on the IHRA definition. Um, it does talk about the fact that it embraces it. However, the issue here is also it makes reference to an alternate definition, which is called the nexus definition. If you have any questions, I'm by all means more than happy to sort of um, explore that further. But the, the the concern with that is that the nexus definition seeks to, in, in some ways, water down the IHRA definition, specifically insofar as it relates to Israel. And to be more precise, and I, I'll quote this part, where it's, it, it assumes that unless there is outright violence in, involved, anti-Zionism is generally not anti-Semitism. I'll repeat that. The nexus definition assumes that if there is a outright, if there is no outright violence involved, then anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. Now, that, of course, I think uh, that kind of formulation is very problematic because we also know that um, words um, and um, pervasive rhetoric that we see does lead to violence, can lead to uh, to incitement, and that's something that I think is important that we do not equivocate on. Uh, but that it's important also to uh, note that the Nexus definition has not been adopted by any international body, any international agency, any governmental um governmental uh, uh, sector and whereas the, the whereas the white house plan refers to and reiterates the embrace of the ihra definition it only talks uh with respect to nexus the fact that there are other definitions um that do exist um so it's not um any kind of adoption of nexus but it does bring it into the equation and it does give it uh, give it some uh, some wiggle room essentially. Um, the white the the White House plan does single out uh, the rise in white extremism, which is critical. It's important. It's necessary. It should be there. However, it does not specifically single out also the rise in anti-Zionism as a form of anti-Semitism and BDS as well, which is a modern manifestation, I would say, of anti-Semitism today and in many ways in whether it's on campuses in civil society uh, that's also where we're seeing a large uh, surge in anti-semitism today so i think it would have been important for that to be reiterated unfortunately it wasn't um however by reference to the ihra definition which does also refer to anti-zionism as a form of anti-semitism um it does um incorporate that in that regard um, the one thing which is uh, inexplicable, and no one is able to yet provide a uh, uh, to provide an um, an answer to that, is why in the, there's a host of different organisations, civil society groups, and stakeholders that were included in this plan. Um, Ninety nine point nine percent of them are, you know, kosher, so to speak, without a problem. However, there is the inclusion of one particular group, the uh, Council on American Islamic Relations, um, which was included as one of the stakeholders. Now, this is very problematic because they are in many ways seen as an extremist group, as an anti-Semitic group, and that have also been placed on the FBI 
watch list as well who have had uh, concerns regarding some of their connections, including with a with the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, so that is um, disconcerting. Uh, but again, that is one element in what is a much also much larger uh, larger strategy and plan. Um, I'll try and be uh, brief, perhaps a little bit in terms of specifically on the point of the IRA definition, because when we're talking about you know anti-Semitism, you know at, at the core of the issue is also unless you can define what it is you're trying to defeat, then it is not something that you can defeat. So any plan, any strategy also has to revolve around having that kind of definition. So when you're looking at a, the IHRA definition here, we have to remember this is the most widely endorsed definition in the world. Over 40 countries have um, embraced it, adopted it, um, or otherwise. Um, over half the uh, states across America have adopted it in one way, form, or another. Over 1,000 institutions around the world, civil society, educational, have adopted it. Um, it is a bipartisan issue as well, which is critical here. Not only has the US administration in this plan and at the beginning of the Biden's term said that they are quite enthusiastically embrace the IHRA definition, but the former administration of President Trump likewise um, had said so as well. And in fact, they passed or President Trump um, signed off an executive order with respect to the situation on campus, specifically singling out the IHRA definition there as well. So it is um, it is relevant, it is important, it is a consensus definition in the sense that it is something that it was something that was in the works for over 15 years, different experts, stakeholders, lawmakers that have um, um, uh, that contributed in terms of um, in terms of defining it. Um, and the real issue sort of at the core of that definition is the fact that it does make reference to Israel. And that's important because anti-Semitism today is not merely the singling out against Jews as individuals, but as we know, it also manifests in the singling out and vilification against the state of Israel as well, including um, anti-Zionism, including boycott movements and so on. And the definition makes very clear that um, criticizing Israel to the same extent as any other democracy is not anti-Semitic, and that's fine. But then it does give you a number of uh, contemporary examples where it does cross the red line. For example, comparing Israeli policy to the Nazis, denying Jews the equal right to self-determination, um, applying uh, stereotypes, and so on. Um, so it does also make it very clear. And a large uh, sort of part of the criticism of the definition has been that it somehow stifles free speech or that it uh, um, pro or that it um, restricts Palestinian advocacy. It doesn't do any of those sorts of things. It very clearly, I think, uh, just delineates a line where acceptable criticism does cross that boundary. And I think uh, that's, um, that's responsible and that's necessary. Um, but at the end of the day, and you know, I just I'll conclude on this so we can have some uh, some questions. Um, ultimately, the definition here was in this plan, and there's a lot of um, contention, a lot of uh, concern here. Was only one small part of it. Um, yes, it is important, but this was also a plan that was looking at um, combating anti-Semitism from a very sort of holistic and macro point of view, um, not merely in terms of definitional, which is at the end of the day also up to the different agencies, the different departments, um, the different bodies. And we've seen that Department of Education and Department of State already adopted. It's not something that the White House itself, for example, can formally adopt. Um, it can be passed as law if um, lawmakers would, uh, would like to do so. But I think the the priority here was ultimately on what sort of tools, what sort of action items they can uh, that can be implemented in terms of uh, rooting out um, the scourge of uh, of anti-Semitism from um, from multi-faceted uh, point of view and a communal point of view. Um, I believe that is more or less my my time on on this particular topic. Um, I know I try to cover a lot. Um, there's a lot more that I could have covered, so my, my apologies, uh, but. By all means, please, if you have any questions on this, um, let me know. Uh, great, Arson. Thank you so much for those comments. We we do have um, some questions that are coming in, and I'll add um, more of mine if we have time. Um, the, the first question actually relates to 
the BDS scenario. And the question, if I could distill it down, is um, if, if companies that are in BDS um, do business on the West Bank, is that in and of itself anti-Semitic? And um, how, how is that related to the Israeli government's current policies about the West Bank? So I wasn't sure on Tali Fuller, you mean if companies uh, are prevented from doing business in the West no. Bank, is that anti-Semitic? No, if they are doing business in the West Bank, in, if they support BDS and do business in the West Bank, is that in and of itself anti-Semitic? Um, I would think not because it's sort of uh, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, if on the one hand they're doing business um, in the West Bank, um, it's sort of difficult to claim that that is that they're engaging in a form of anti-Semitism because they're involved on a on a commercial and a business level. So I think that would be um, in that respect um, that would be difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you want to, for example, compare it to say Ben and Jerry's case which would be very, very different when they said, well, you know, if um, we, um, um, if we force you to withdraw uh, your operations from the West Bank, um, that may be deemed as, as anti-Semitic because that is applying a, a form of a double standard that is not applied to other, whether conflict zones or uh, that is specifically um, uh, restricted to the situation here. So I think in, in that case, it's a little bit different. Um, I hope that, that answers the question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, another question, you, you did mention the White House plan addresses in particular anti-Semitism on university campuses in the United States. W what does the White House plan actually say about that? How does it address it? Um, a couple of things. And, um, you know, I think it's important also we can draw that to some of the circumstances that we're seeing now as well with the, with the Cooney Law School, what, what happened there, and uh, even with the uh, UC Berkeley uh, last year as well. Um, there are two things I would say about the situation on campus. One is that the, uh, the White House plan does make very clear, and I'll, I'll quote that part because it's, it's important. It says, when Jews are targeted because of their beliefs or their identity, when Israel is singled out because of anti-Jewish hatred, that is anti-Semitism, that is unacceptable. Uh, so on the one hand, that is a lot of the, where a lot of the hatred emanates from on campuses, number one. Uh, number two, and this is a critical as well, the White House plan makes specific reference to the Civil Rights Act. Now, why is that important? Because every university, uh, to some extent, others more so than others, uh, receive federal funding, um, meaning that they fall within the purview of the Civil Rights Act. And the Civil Rights Act is very clear in that it says that you cannot discriminate on the basis of race, national origin, or shared ancestry. So within that uh, context, uh, you can claim that, for example, anti-Zionism becomes a form of anti-Semitism. And the UC Berkeley case is a perfect example where actually we have uh, initiated a claim against UC Berkeley when last year a number of uh, student groups from the UC Berkeley Law School said that they would not uh, permit Zionist speakers. So whereas the university is saying, well, this is a form of uh, free speech, which is covered under the First Amendment, whereas we're saying, well, hold on, Zionism is not merely a political expression of speech, it's also an inherent and indispensable part of our Jewish identity which means that it's not merely a First Amendment issue, but it's one of basic discrimination. And as a university that receives federal funding, they therefore are liable within the Civil Rights Act as well. So the White House plan does make specific reference to the Civil Rights Act, specifically as a tool uh, within, the, um, within the ambit of uh, combating anti-Semitism on campus and within some responsibilities that are placed on the Department of Education, specifically in that regard, which uh, manages this act. Great. Uh, thank you, Arson. We, I think given our time constraints, let's move on. I know there are other questions, but let's move on to the, the next topic on the updated, the International Court of Justice. 
Um, all right, I'll, uh, I'll try and be uh, I'll try and be a little brief um, or as brief as, as I can on, on that because uh, I think look at the end of the day I think we know the conclusion and that's uh, that's the reality. Um, the ICJ, for those of you that don't know, it's the principal judicial body of the United Nations. Um, we have the ICC, which is the International Criminal Court, which acts as a uh, basically as a quasi-independent body, and the International Criminal Court looks specifically at cases against individuals. So, um, and we already have a case, uh, we already have an investigation open against Israelis there for various uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity committed by individuals. Um, ICJ looks at disputes between states, uh, one, and number two, it looks at advisory, um, not looks at advisory opinions, but uh, provides an advisory opinion. And that's something that can be requested by the, um, uh, UN uh, by the member states themselves or by the UN General Assembly. Um, it's important also here to know that the only other time in the court's history that a decision or an advisory opinion has been um, has been made with respect to Israel was in 2004 with respect to the uh, security fence. Now this was 2004 and uh, in the height of the second Intifada and the ramifications of that opinion still reverberate. They, they reverberate um, within the legal sphere, within um, international um, law papers, within the UN, within resolutions and so on. Um, so what happens at the ICJ does have ramifications um, and it is important to bear that in mind that we cannot just dismiss it altogether, perhaps like we did with the ICC, which is a far more political uh, body. Um, this particular case, so that um, for those of you that may be uh, not aware in terms of how we got to where we are now, um, it, um, it arose out of the UN Commission of Inquiry, which I'll touch on in my next section, um, where a recommendation was made that, um, um, that the um, um, General Assembly um, request of the International Court of Justice to provide an advisory opinion on the legal status of the occupation. That's that's how it was how it was phrased. So at the end of uh, last year, uh, December 2022, the resolution of the UN passed overwhelmingly with some like 85, 87 uh, votes in favor. There was, uh, I think, about 20 odd votes against that, including the United States and um, something like 50 odd abstentions. But this is the UN General Assembly and we're a simple majority um, suffices. Um, the, the text of the re resolution itself is very straightforward. Essentially, it asks, what are the legal consequences arising from the ongoing uh, violation by Israel of the uh, Palestinian people's right to self-determination and by virtue of Israel's permanent occupation? The phrase permanent here is important because what they're saying essentially is that what was once a uh, temporary or de facto occupation, this is the language that they're using, has now, by virtue of the time lapsed and the policies enacted, has become a permanent occupation, which uh, is a crime in international law. And therefore, uh, the court wants to look at a or the, the mandate it has to look at is or what are the practical, what are the legal consequences arising out of that, arising out of this permanent occupation. Um, in addition to that, they're also looking at the status of Jerusalem now. And when you're looking also at the mandate of the, the ICJ, even the Temple Mount, which is, of course, the holiest site uh, to Jews, is, by the way, solely referred to by its Muslim name here of Al-Haram al-Sharif. So, you know, then already sort of you're starting out from a point where, you know, they're looking at what is such a highly contested uh, point, but they're already, you can see, setting a, setting a line where this is sort of direction where this is uh, going. Um, in the past, uh, whereas Israeli governments have said that, you know, Israel's presence in Jordan, Samaria and the West Bank was temporary, it was pending um, negotiations. Um, and now uh, what is being said is that Israel is there under a permanent um, uh, presence, uh, which is illegal under international law. And therefore the question is, well, what are Israel's, uh, or sorry, what are the different obligations and what are the different um, 
um, different elements of international law which um, are applicable here in terms of possible uh, punitive measures as well um, that, that, can, that can apply. Um, the Commission, um, as I said, the actual mandate itself for the court emanates from the Commission of Inquiry, where this was um, uh, this was put forward as one of the one of the requirements. Um, but it is also you have to look at it in context. You know, it also didn't come from a from a vacuum. This is something that has been part of the many many years of a relentless campaign of lawfare, of uh, civil society, of the groups like Amnesty, like Human Rights Watch like others which are really trying to uh, take the conflict, uh, what is a, say, a, a dispute between Israelis and Palestinians, and to try and internationalize it within the legal system as a way to, um, uh, to pass punitive measures against Israel. And one of the ramifications, certainly from Israel's perspective, is that by doing so, it removes or negates any uh, incentive for the Palestinians to actually negotiate um, any kind of resolution if they know that they can uh, get what they want essentially by going uh, to the courts. Uh, but the implications of this are very, uh, very real and very serious. And I would say in a strategic and legal uh, point of view, um, very important for us to look at. Even though this is an advisory opinion, it is not binding. It doesn't have any binding weight in international law. Uh, however, that said, um, the International Court of Justice is exceptionally highly regarded um, within the legal sphere. There is a great deal of the moral way of prestige that is placed to decisions, to opinions of the, of the Court of Justice. It is a reference point by the legal community, uh, by the civil society, by the United Nations. Um, it forms the basis of resolutions. Uh, we see legal cases that refer to the ICJ decisions and advisory opinions as evidence. We see reports uh, at the UN and others that are made out, again, that refer to this. We see individual states, whether it's in the US, in Europe, elsewhere, that can make reference to the opinions or the decisions of the court uh, in terms of their um, diplomatic actions, their uh, policy actions, uh, their punitive measures, uh, whether against Israel, whether against the particular elements with respect to the settlements, with individuals that might be living in the settlements or those within the government, for example, that might be advocating for greater construction and so on. Um, we know that the BDS movement latches onto this. We know that the, uh, uh, the apartheid uh, movement will latch onto this as well. Um, we know that uh, at the EU, which is exceptionally focused on and you know, place a very high priority, very high regard, on decisions of international courts. Um, they place a very strong emphasis on this as well. We can see that um, emanating in labeling decisions, for example, in terms of will products from Israel be labeled separately as products from the West Bank? Will individuals um, as a result uh, that live, for example, in say Efrat or Ariel, um, would they face consequences? Uh, will Israel be able to enter into different treaties, into different MOUs, um, and so on. Um, so it does have very, very real ramifications. Um, so there are questions in terms of how we proceed and how we respond. Um, in Israel, from Israel's perspective, Israel as a as a government, um, it's not entirely clear. I wish I could have give you a definitive answer, uh, but I cannot. Um, in two thousand and four, when um, um, when advisory opinion about the court was uh, was issued, Israel made only only made a submission insofar as the um, as the court's jurisdiction was concerned, but they did not make any uh, submissions about substantive issues. Um, I suspect here in this case there will be something similar. Um, I don't believe the Israeli government has made a definitive decision. Um, they will almost certainly um, respond on the jurisdictional issue, said this is not the appropriate forum, um, but it remains to be seen whether they will make any submissions on substantive issues. Um, we know that over 20 countries voted against the, um, um, against the UN resolution uh, to, um, to take this matter to the ICJ. Um, so the question now is, will these countries that voted against the resolution, will they make submissions against um, um, against the uh, 
uh, the point that is uh, before the court. Um, NGOs in this particular, uh, within the Court of Justice, um, are not allowed to make submissions, but international organisations can, and that, but that includes uh, um, different UN bodies, entities like, say, UNESCO, WHO, and, and the like. Um, but it remains to be seen, um, again, what the United States will do. Will, will the US make a submission? We don't know that yet. Um, the court's timetable, um, there's not a lot of time. Um, submissions need to be made by the end of July. And then by the end of October, um, um, states that made submissions can make responses to those submissions. So there's not a lot of time left. Uh, but there are things that, and I'll try and sum up uh, briefly before we, uh, before we take some questions. There are things that you as lawyers specifically here can do. Uh, you can approach your elected officials. Um, you can uh, make submissions of your own, which uh, the court uh, might not necessarily give full regard to. I'm only saying that because they have to give regard to submissions by international bodies. However, what uh, we are trying to do, for example, is to create a shadow brief uh, to have experts and organizations to come together and provide an alternate perspective and, and point of view. Uh, but ultimately, we know where the we know where the decision is moving to. We know the ramifications will be legal, will be political, uh, will be felt on the ground on campuses in the BDS uh, movement as well. So it is important that we start acting now, that we start collecting uh, legal, um, um, essentially creating a, a legal defense. Uh, because ultimately, as I said, the ramifications, even though it's uh, advisory opinion, uh, can be. Uh, uh, can be long term, and certainly if the security fence twenty years later is still uh, still with us, uh, this certainly can be um, uh, much more into the future. Right. Thank you. Let me let me uh, raise one question from yeah. from our audience. Uh, you, uh, Arsen, had mentioned you know um, submissions, whether by Israel, other organizations, or or perhaps even lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, Beyond that, um, can, can we in the United States and perhaps can Israel take any other action to be proactive in countering the claims and perceptions and statements about Israel's treatment of the Palestinians? Um, in welcoming um, Holocaust deniers, we saw only the other week, for example, where the day after Israel's 75th um, uh, anniversary, they held a Nakba Day event where Mahmoud Abbas stood before the UN podium and uh, literally um, engaged in a form of uh, Holocaust distortion and was loudly applauded to by many countries, including from Europe uh, there. Uh, the United States uh, was one of the many countries that, uh, that did the right thing and uh, took the principal decision not to, not to attend. Um, there are many, many things we can talk about, I think, when it comes uh, to the UN, uh, but we don't have a lot of time and we could do a whole session just on the UN. Um, so I wanted to, uh, in this um, in this case, really just touch on a couple, on really two, maybe three points in terms of what we should be looking for um, in the coming months, uh, a few things that should be on your, uh, um, on your radars, uh, which are important, I think, which have also both legal, political and diplomatic uh, ramifications. Um, one of them is the UN Commission of Inquiry. Um, this is an instrument of the UN Human Rights Council, the same Human Rights Council, which has, uh, which has condemned Israel almost more times than the entire world put together. The same Human Rights Council that devotes one agenda item permanently to condemning Israel and then one agenda item to the whole world, uh, human rights abuses in the rest of the world. The same Human Rights Council that has a uh, the likes of uh, Venezuela, China, Qatar, Bangladesh, Pakistan on its um, on its committee. Um, the commission is, however, disconcerting again a number of levels. Uh, this is uh, a commission inquiry that was created in 2001 in the wake of the war with Hamas, uh, where some 4,000 plus rockets were fired at Israel, with the um, and the mandate of looking at the and I quote the underlying root causes of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now, the resolution establishing this commission did not even mention the word Hamas once. And it was created in the wake of the war with 
Hamas. So you understand already from the beginning where this is going. This is no commission inquiry. This is quite frankly an inquisition. Uh, this is a uh, something that is unprecedented even in the UN uh, UN standards. Um, this is uh, really along the lines of Zionism is racism resolution, but on steroids here. That's the best way that I would I would put it. Unfortunately, um, the outcome here has already been predetermined from the very beginning. We know that by the uh, mission of Hamas from the resolution, uh, the mandate um, is something that will exist in perpetuity forever. Um, it is something that can look at by saying, looking at the underlying root causes. It means that everything from pre, including pre-1948 to into the future from uh, to now and beyond. It is a commission that exists essentially indefinitely. It does not have an end date. It has a budget that is more than twice that of any other Mission, including on Syria, where over half a million people have been uh, have been slaughtered. Um, it employs at least 18 people. Um, it works in a secretive manner. We don't know exactly who is uh, who is on the staff. We don't know uh, what um, criteria they use. We don't know who they're meeting with, apart from we know that some of the uh, hostile NGOs, uh, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, and like. The most disconcerting thing, however, is, um, and this is where you understand where this is going, is who was appointed as the commissioners. There are three people appointed here. One was uh, Nadi Pile. Nadi Pile is a former UN Human Rights Commissioner um, who, in 2009, if you remember the second um, Durban Review Conference in Geneva, when she applauded participation of Iran, where then Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was the president. She is someone who has already accused Israel of apartheid, of war crimes, who has said that she hopes the BDS movement takes off, I quote, that she hopes that it takes off like the anti-apartheid movement has as well. Um, she is someone who has uh, employed in the past uh, individuals associated with PFLP terror groups, um, so this is where she's coming from. You have another commissioner there by the name of Milun Pathari, who, if you remember last year, had actually said, I quote, the Jewish lobby, the Jewish lobby uh, controls social media. And this is someone who has, who is a judge, again, on this committee, and someone who Pile herself defended. And the third uh, judge is, uh, an, is an Australian by the name of Chris Sedotti, who said that uh, when... Uh, when Jews, um, when Jews um, make accusations of anti-Semitism, it is like throwing confetti at a wedding. Um, he then is said that Jews make too much uh, noise in um, in invoking uh, Holocaust issues in terms of uh, as a form of anti-Semitism, and is also called for uh, embargoes against the state of Israel. Now. Anywhere, any uh, democracy, any developed nation in the United States, um, if you were a judge exhibiting such blind bias and hatred, you would never be appointed as a judge or you'd have to recuse yourself. But at the UN, you get promoted for this kind of anti-Semitism and virulent bias and hatred. And the important thing here to remember also is that this is also in breach of the UN's own guidelines which require not only uh, objectivity and independence but the perception of objectivity and impartiality as well which is an even higher onus um ultimately we know this is a malicious uh manipulation of international law that's divorced from any kind of uh, reality or and a gross really distortion of truth um fast forward um the committee um, reports to the UN twice a year, once to the Gen oh, sorry, once to the Human Rights Council, and then once to the General Assembly, which is more or less the same findings. Um, the in two, um, last year in June, they made their first uh, observations. You'll be shocked, I'm sure, to hear that uh, they uh, they blame Israel, um, the occupation as the root cause of of, of all elements of the conflict. Uh, they blame Israel for displacement, for demolitions. Uh, settlers were responsible for violence. Israel's in breach of various UN rules and guidelines of prior fact-finding missions. There was zero 
um, mention of Hamas and essentially zero responsibility placed on the or responsibility placed on the Palestinians. Uh, 25 plus nations, including the United States, condemned the report, uh, condemned uh, the findings. Um, and also, I should say, by the way, that we're very outspoken when Malun Kathari especially made those uh, anti-Semitic remarks about, uh, about the Jewish The second report was then, and this is where it's particularly relevant, uh, the second report was, uh, um, <coughs> sorry, released um towards the latter part of last year. And that report already is uh, going up a notch in terms of the gravity of the crimes of actions that Israel is alleged to have committed. Um, it's already talking about uh, the illegality of occupation, about its permanence. It's talking about uh, the transfer, permanent transfer of people, which is a particular kind of war crime under the Geneva Convention. Uh, talking about um, um, denying Palestinians' right to self-determination and so on. Including, um, 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 including even uh, the uh, Israel, uh, they said, uh, was to blame for the mental well-being of, uh, of Palestinians as well. However, and this is where it becomes especially critical, in this particular report, um, two things. One, this is the report which recommended that the General Assembly request that the, um, uh, an advisory opinion from the Court of Justice, which we saw happen several months later. That is a fact now. And the other aspect, which is particularly important from a legal standpoint, it also called on states uh, around the world to exercise their individual powers under international law, meaning for states to apply what is called universal jurisdiction, meaning that there are some crimes that are considered so heinous under international law, war crimes, genocide, and so on, that um, any state, irrespective of whether they have any connection to the victim or the perpetrator, can take action. Um, so this is something um, that we might be seeing, especially in Europe, uh, where, which, where they have different legal systems, where individuals and NGOs can, uh, uh, can make claims uh, before courts. Um, Israel has not cooperated with this committee at all, nor has the United States, nor have many other Western nations. Um, many have called it anti-Semitic. The, the mandate completely one-sided. Um, the, in the US, there is a bill before Congress already called the COI Elimination Act, uh, which calls on, um, on the UN to not just eliminate the this uh, commission, but also to make sure that no U.S. funds go towards it because it goes within the broader UN uh, UN uh, UN budget to which the U.S. and other countries uh, provide uh, contributions to. Um, in a couple of months' time, will come the next report, and this is where this is where it gets serious. Um, so far, they have not yet made the negation of apartheid, but that is coming up. And we, they've already more or less alluded to that. That's, they've said that they're looking into that. If they make that determination, and I would say that is a very, very real possibility that in the coming months, uh, that determination will be made. This will be the first time at the UN that the charge of apartheid against Israel has been entrenched. And that will have enormous, obviously, uh, ramifications. It will also be used as evidence for... Uh, for the International Criminal Court and um, for other uh, UN uh, mechanisms as well. Um, the only other thing I would mention as well to look out for, and this also just um, before I take questions, because it is in the news right now, um, the UN is about to release an important report on uh, children um, in armed conflict. Now, this is particularly serious because uh, this report will accuse Israel of a number of uh, war crimes and actions with respect to uh, children. It will accuse uh, Israel of targeting Palestinian children. We saw just the other day a Palestinian two-year-old boy was uh, very sadly caught in a crossfire. It will accuse Israel of unlawfully detaining Palestinian children. Um, it will even, by the UN's own standards, accuse Israel of recruiting Palestinian ch uh, child soldiers. I repeat, it will accuse Israel, the draft already does, of using of recruiting Palestinian child soldiers. Now, of course, it will not mention the fact that Israel does not target children, it will not mention the fact that Palestinian terrorists use them as human shields, it will not mention that um, the fact that uh, they embed themselves in civilian areas, 
or the effect on Israeli children. The concern here is that if these findings are ultimately adopted, that Israel will be placed on a blacklist, on a blacklist with country, with entities, including Boko Haram, including Taliban, including ISIS, uh, countries that are uh, or, or terrorist entities that are engaged in the most uh, heinous of uh, international war crimes. And that will come with punitive measures that will come with the various human rights ramifications and um, that will come with uh, various uh, penalties within the international legal sphere, within the UN, within the civil society, uh, you name it. Um, Steve, I see you online, so I'll, uh, I'll cut that there. There's, we can talk about the UN forever. I'd, I'd rather leave on a more positive note if I can, uh, but <laughs> I'm, in your, I'm in your hand. Well, well uh, let, me, let me just uh, follow up with one question before we, we wrap up. Yes. Um, you did mention the Human Rights Council and uh, withdrew, we withdrew from it under the prior administration, we're back in it. What are your thoughts about whether the United States should be part of the Human Rights Council? Um, look, that's, that's a tough question. Um, when, the, uh, when the US withdrew um, under um, Pompeo and Nikki Haley, they said that the Human Rights Council became a cesspool of uh, not just political bias, but specifically singling it out for discrimination of Israel. And that's a fact. When uh, this administration re-entered the Human Rights Council, they did so with a view that they could make a bigger difference by being within than by being outside. Now, the unfortunate reality is that I don't think that that is measured up because, you know, you, you look at the makeup of the Human Rights Council, it's still, you know, until recently, it still had Russia. It, it counts members like China, Venezuela, Cuba, uh, Pakistan, you name it. And Israel continues to be singled out. There has been no real, any noticeable, marketable difference when it comes to Israel. So I think there is a valid case to be made that should the US be lending any kind of legitimacy or any kind of credibility to the Human Rights Council? That's that's a fair, fair point to make. Um, the, I think the bigger issue here is that whereas we understand that and all of you i'm sure do that the un as a body has been you know to say that it's been hostile to israel and the jewish people would be a gross understatement however whereas we know that i would say that the majority of people do not know that the majority of people when they hear the human rights council when they hear the un they think you know it's they look at it as gospel they think oh the human rights council um you know it, it's you know, it's we we have to take every every word at, at, at face value, but they don't necessarily see the the uh, the gross bias, the double standards. In fact, the UN itself fails to live up to its own mandate when it um, elects, you know, Iran as the vice president of the General Assembly. You know, this is what we're dealing with. Um, so it's a tough question to answer: Should the US be on the committee or not? Uh, what is not difficult to answer is that whether it is or isn't uh, that the U.S. must continue to be a leading voice against the the singling out and disc and discrimination of Israel at the UN. Uh, I know um, Anthony Blinken just reiterated that the other day when the U.S. and Israel signed the Jerusalem Declaration when President Biden was here. Um, that was also a point of that the U.S. said that they would stand up for Israel, including at the UN. So whether it's as a member of the committees or not, I think it's important both that the U.S. government stand up, but also that members of Congress can do that as well. And there are a lot of powers within appropriations, within within funding of various U.N. bodies as well, where uh, a lot of influence can be exerted as well. So I think we need to bear that in mind also. Uh, thank, thank you, Arson. I, I, I just want to wrap this up. Um, we are truly uh, privileged, honored to have had you share your thoughts with us. It's been enlightening. Um, thank you again, and I'll turn this over to uh, to Ellen. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Especially want to thank you, our guest speaker, Arson, uh, for sharing all of your amazing expertise and insights on this important topic. We are so grateful for all of the work you are doing. Uh, to all the attendees, all attorneys attending CLE program today will receive an email today with a link to your CLE certificate. 
Please also look out for an email with more details on join us at our global conference and opportunities to visit Israel. If you have additional questions for Arsen, please feel free to stay on the Zoom as he can spend a few more minutes with us. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll uh, reach out and so say, if anyone has a question to please post it in the Q&A. Uh, so we'll give you a, a, a minute or two. Maybe I'll ask you a question, Arson, while we're waiting to see if others have any questions. Um, going back to the White House plan, did the White House, does the White House plan address any of the issues that you identified with the UN? Or is the White House plan purely kind of US centric? I, Arson, I think you're on mute. Sorry, um, it is 99% uh, US centric. However, it does say, um, and I can quote, because I've uh, heard that part here, it does say um, when Israel is singled out because of anti-Jewish hatred, that is anti-Semitism. Um, so even though it doesn't refer to the UN or the international arena specifically, it does make the case that when Israel is singled out, that is and can be a form of um, anti-Semitism. So you, you can say that that it does uh, within that uh, interpretation. So I wanted to go back to another uh, comment you made earlier about the definition of anti-Semitism. And can you, can you uh, be a little bit more kind of descriptive of where criticism of Israel crosses the line from being critical of uh, another democracy to becoming anti-Semitic? Um, sure. I mean, look, I think the, you know, we, we all know the, there's the Sharet Natan Sharansky 3D test, uh, delegitimization, demonization, and double standards in a, in a nutshell. Uh, but the IHRA definition also makes it very clear, and I think uh, very, um, uh, very fairly, it does say that criticism of Israel as uh, directed as any other country is not anti-Semitic. However, then it does say, you know, circumstances where that does cross a red line. And if you're, for example, comparing the Israeli government policy to Nazis, that is a form of anti-Semitism, which we are seeing, by the way, a lot more happening today. When um, Israel is accused of, um, or de demonized by mendacious uh, stereotypes, that is anti-Semitism. When you're denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination in ancestral land, that is anti-Semitism. Um, it doesn't talk about, um, and it does intentionally, it doesn't talk about, um, 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 how should I put it, sorry. Um, you know, it doesn't refer to BDS. It does, you know, it, it leaves that open to interpretation. I, I know someone had asked that before, but the IHRA definition was never meant to be um, um, codified into law. The IHRA definition is meant to serve as a guide, as a guide on what might form anti-Semitism, and if so, uh, how that can be used within existing structures, for example, within existing racial discrimination legislation, within campuses and, and so on. But when you're talking about a sort of really Israel, um, you know, the way I would look at it is if, you know, if you're applying a double standard to Israel that's not applied to any other democracy, when you are singling out Israel for opprobrium, or when you are demonizing the Jewish state, that is a form of anti-Semitism. Criticism of Israeli government policy is fine, but essentially when those three elements or any one of those are at play, the double standards, the demonizing language, and the delegitimizing of Israel's right also to exist as a Jewish state, then that crosses a, crosses a red line. Uh, one, one of our questions from our audience, um, can you comment on developments in Holocaust-related education as a tool to combat ongoing anti-Semitism? Um, yeah, yes, to an extent. I mean, I think it's, it's critical because we are seeing today um, not just, I think, a form of Holocaust denial, but really a form of Holocaust distortion as well. Um, we saw Mahmoud Abbas saying that at the UN. Um, we've seen it um, 
you know, comparing um, all sorts of crises uh, to the Holocaust. Uh, there are people who said during the whole COVID crisis that this is uh, comparing, um, you know, say vaccinations to Jews wearing Star of David. Um, we have seen um, musicians like Roger Waters, for example, engaging in the form of Holocaust distortion by that's dressing up as a Nazi or taking Anne Frank's name. Um, we're seeing uh, online, especially if you know, if you open up Twitter or Instagram, TikTok, you're seeing this really vicious form of uh, Holocaust, both not just denial but distortion, comparing it, analogizing it, uh, minimizing it as well. So I think Holocaust education is absolutely critical. Um, many young people today, quite frankly, do not know where or what Auschwitz is. There was a survey done um, a couple of years ago, which actually, um, um, I forget the, the number, but a number of millennials thought that Auschwitz was a beer. That they thought that Auschwitz was a beer. Now, I, you know, my wildest dreams or nightmares could not make up such a scenario, but that is the situation. And the younger generation knows less and less and less. However, what I would say, and it's equally important, that not only must we educate about the Holocaust, we also need to educate about Jewish culture as well, because our identity is not tied exclusively to the Holocaust. Whilst, yes, it forms a you know, critical element, also of the surging anti-Semitism, when we're talking about education, I think it's important, and talking about the future, that we also educate people about our about Jewish identity, about Jewish culture, about what well, the Torah values, about the contribution of Jews to various cultural elements as well. So I, you know, I, I would sort of add um, add that caveat that in as much as we have to teach about racism, about Holocaust and education, I think it's important to also teach about Jewish and Zionist education and I know that's something that uh, you guys at JNF do exceptionally well as well. Right. Uh, maybe we have time for for one more question. Um, this this could be a, a, an easy one for you. Are there any um, fact sheets available on the UN's situation and any action items or suggestions of what we as lawyers can do to help um, kind of minimize the scenario at the UN? Um, it really depends, uh, yes, yes or no, but it, it really depends on where at the UN we're talking about and which agency and which department and the way they operate because the way that um, the Human Rights Council or General Assembly operate are very different. We didn't even touch on UNRWA and UNRWA itself is um, um, one of the most, I think, uh, um, disconcerting um organs of the UN and one of the greatest impediments to peace and where I would say unfortunately in this regard that the US administration upped their uh, uh, monetary contribution. I think that's in this regard that's disconcerting because UNRWA is a body that only perpetuates I think uh, the conflict. Um, so the, to answer your question, yes there are uh, fact sheets. It depends on which particular element you're talking about. I think I mentioned in the chat option below if anyone does have questions um, or with, regarding which specific um, specific uh, element of the of the UN, uh, I'm more than happy to try and uh, find that for you guys as well and provide any further uh, info. Great. I, I want to thank Arson once again. He's been so kind to. Um, if you have questions that weren't answered, his uh, email address is in the chat bar, so you can take a quick look at his for his email address. And once again, Arson, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and your time. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And again, really grateful for all the incredible work that uh, not just you guys as, as lawyers do, but as uh, JNF. It's amazing to see it really uh, before our eyes here in Israel. So deeply appreciate that as well. So thank you for this opportunity. Thanks again.
Yeah.